sorry, I forgot to turn the phone call feature off on my phone. Ah, anyway, um, when we talk about the arrest of abusers and when we talk about um, factors impacting abuser, the arrest of the abuser, we could have a victim that does not want the abuser arrested because maybe they do provide financial support, maybe they provide transportation, maybe there's a stigma that they don't want to have attached to their family or they don't want the neighbors to see your partner being escorted out of the house in handcuffs by police. There could be all sorts of factors involved. The victim could be blaming herself and shaming herself. Uh, we could have a victim who has battered woman syndrome and she has internalized everything that has happened to her and she blames herself for everything. There could be a plethora of reasons um, and we just don't know. But when we do take an offender into custody and we have a victim who changes their mind, we don't unarrest the offender, okay? We don't take the handcuffs off and say, never mind, here you go we move forward, we proceed, all right? We have our discretion to fall back on, and hopefully we have a good working relationship with our partner, our police partner, so that we can be there to support each other and help each other make sound decisions in the field. But just because a victim says no at that point, I don't want that person arrested, we don't just leave and let it go. It doesn't work that way, okay? So be mindful of that. Um, let's see, when we talk about arrest of abuse, abusers, um, we also have the Minneapolis uh, experiment. And essentially, there were three requirements in the experiment, three behaviors they were looking at on behalf of police, and they wanted to explore the outcomes. And the three behaviors were immediate arrest of the abuser, send the abuser away from the scene, or if the abuser refuses to leave, arrest them and provide advice and support for the victim and the offender. Um, and so what the experiment um, revealed, there were like over 300 cases that the experiment reviewed and 10% of the arrested suspects committed a subsequent arrest. So immediate arrest of the offender and then their release that immediate arrest was not necessarily a deterrent for that individual to stop engage, engaging in abusive or aggressive or violent behavior. 24% of the suspects who were sent from the home, so again, someone who wasn't arrested but they were separated and sent away from the home, repeated acts of violence against their spouses. Okay, so that's twice as much as immediate arrest. Okay, so immediate arrest was the most effective. The least effective was that suspects who were sent away from the home repeated acts of violence against their spouses. And in between the two results at 19% of the suspects who were advised by the officers committed another offense. Okay, so arrest, sending away and advice, okay? Those were the three behaviors that were studied. And um, even though arrest had the lowest rates of reoffending, 10% of people got out of custody and committed a subsequent offense, okay? Most likely the same victim, all right? Um, and that's essentially it. Um, really quick, I forgot to mention, I'm going to take it back a minute. Um, when we talk about marriage as a theory on intimate partner abuse, pages 144 to 145, there are three subheadings to marriage um, that you need to be familiar with. Isolation, autonomy and control, and investment in the relationship. So isolation autonomy and control, investment in the relationship. And that's it, victimology, for your lecture on Chapter 8, Intimate Partner Abuse. Make sure to review that and have a fabulous evening. Enjoy and reach out to me via text or email if you have any questions or need clarification or just need some additional support and validation. Have a good one, you guys. Bye.